Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Chapter 3, the great book of Revelation. We're going to pick it up in verse 4 here. Still concerning the church Sardis. Sardis was located, it was a commercial town. And when you have a lot of commercial activity, you got a little bit of everything. All right? And Jesus just makes it real clear coming out the gate. He said, you serve a name that brings you death. Uh, not life because it was only Christ that brings life so this church he kind of he turns thumbs down on it coming out the gate however you must realize out of each of the churches if a person knows the truth has eyes to see and ears to hear he's not going to condemn them but he will condemn the church hierarchy and the church itself as far as either teaching God's Word or dealing with Sybil, as was the case of this church, which is the mother of all gods. How people like to deceive themselves. So having said that, we ask a word of wisdom from our Father. And I might say, we're here in this particular church. We're on first, second, third, fourth. We're in the fifth church. And so far... There's only been one that Jesus approved of that taught what he requested to be taught, that he was pleased with, that you could rest assured you, had a, you were on your way to heaven. You were pleasing to the Father. And that was the church of Smyrna uh, back in chapter 2, uh, verse 8. You have, it isn't the name of the church, it's the content that was taught there, that content being the Word of God. Okay, so with the, back again with Sardis, which doesn't have much going for it. Verse 4 of chapter 3, the great book of Revelation, meaning to reveal truth. That's being the name Revelation, to reveal. Verse 4, and it reads, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And naturally, what is white in heaven? It is the linen that is woven from your righteous acts here on earth in the flesh body. You don't have any righteous acts. Sorry, you got no linen and you're naked. All right. He said some of you, and the reason I explain that, it is a figure of speech. And he means they've really, ha there's a few, even in that church, that have performed some righteous acts. Usually you're going to have one or two that God sends in to try to straighten the church out and pull as many out of the fire as you can. But this church is a loser, okay? Verse 5, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Out of what? The book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. I think the good thing that you should draw from this is, is uh, God uh, judges individually. It isn't even so much as um, what church you're in. It's according to what you have in your mind. If you have the truth in your mind that the two churches that he found no fault with, you could be in one of these others planting seeds. And he considers that righteousness. Do you understand? And I think it's wonderful that God judges us not, not by who is around us, unless we're yoked to them, but by our individual choices, our individual beliefs, our individual works. And what does it mean to blot out? Well, it means exactly that. When you're blotted out of that book, you didn't exist, all right? It's just like you never happened. And, and I have to say, not only in this earth age, but even from the first, you're gone, friend. What is the book of life? It's those that live eternal. 
not book of life in the flesh. Life in the flesh is as nothing, really. It's a passing moment out of the eternity of time. You're not really living unless you're in the book of life, which is to say eternal life. Uh, I truly believe in my own heart and mind that the very blotting out itself, removing from the records the entities that we lose, the reason we won't weep for them, we won't remember them. I believe that blotting out means exactly what it says. All the way gone, even from memory and from existence. God spoke and nothing became everything. And uh, let's go with the next verse. Verse 6. He that hath an ear, uh, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's very important. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you're a fortunate person indeed. Now, we come to the church of Philadelphia, which out of the seven is one of the two that Christ found no fault with. Let's see if we can pick up the content that that church possesses. And if I were you, I'd use it as a yardstick to compare my own church that I attend with it. Because if your own church doesn't teach what Smyrna and Philadelphia teach, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. You're in bad shape. And unless you're one of those that's weaving fine linen, verse 7. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, and of course to Delphia and Phila and Delphia, uh, church of brotherly love, okay? Um, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shut it, and no man openeth. Uh, I'm going to tell you something about the key of David. The key of David is knowing who you are, knowing who David's offspring were, which is to say, true Messiah. And certainly you know the difference between true Messiah and the false Messiah. If you, in planting seeds, open the door of a mind, so that that mind's eyes see truth from God's word, no one, no one will ever take that student away from God. No one, no amount of lies, no amount of false teaching, no amount of rumors, lies, will ever turn that student of God's word away from the door of open truth, that is to say, God's word. Once, once one tastes the truth, the beauty of that truth, there is no way you're going to get him to shut the door back on truth and go with some crowd. It's not going to happen. It's just, it goes against God's nature and it goes, and as much as we're made in his image and likeness, it goes against our nature. Because it it comes down to the saying of what would you take in exchange for your soul? And even as much deeper than that, it is your love for our Father. Our love for our Father is so great that we would allow nothing to come in the way of that other than serving Him. As it is written in Luke chapter 14, He that doesn't love me more than he does his own family, children, brother, wife. And of course it says that hates, but that's, it means love less. You have to be sold on the word of God and accomplishing. If you want his blessings, he's the nearest relative you've got. Always stick with him. But when you open that door... It is impossible for anyone to close it in the minds of an individual. That is, that, that in itself documents that God is true, that God's word is true. No one, no one can ever take that away from you. No man can ever shut the door of your mind back to truth when you know the difference between the true Messiah uh, from the root of Jesse springs a, a, a sprout and that sprout was David and from him would come Messiah, the true Messiah. And the fake is an abomination to us. Uh, 
it's wonderful to open the door of the truth. This is why uh, you're, you're not going to lose people away from truth once they see it. That's an impossibility. Verse 8. He continues with this church, uh, this particular one. Another one that he loves. You, you, you teach what's in this church taught. You're in good standing with God. Verse 8. I know thy works. Again there, what, what works do you have? Works are important to God. Otherwise you're a do-nothing. Got it? Behold, I have set before thee an open door into truth, of course, and no man can shut it. It doesn't matter how much someone with idiocies and the uh, traditions of men, they can't close the door on truth once you've seen it. For thou hast a little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name. Well, how would people deny his name? Going with the wrong Messiah. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen in this generation, that the fake is coming. He has his own children, they do his own bidding, and the deception is set, and if people want to believe it, God will even help them, as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I shall send them strong delusion so that they believe the lie if they want to close the door on God's truth. So, um, therefore, they are without excuse. So, here we see again in this church, God's pleasure, that they haven't denied His name by accepting the faults. They remain spiritual virgins, so to speak, in the truth and the Word of God. Verse 9, Behold, again, this is the likeness to the other church He's pleased with. Listen to it carefully. Very important. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, the Udas, which say they are of our brother Judah, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. In other words, there's, God finds no fault in that. He says, I love you, and I'm going to make sure they know it. Why, why do they worship at your feet? They're, they're certainly not worshiping you. It's because you are at the feet of Christ. And on the first day of the millennium, the Lord's Day, which we covered so well back in chapter 1, verse 10, uh, uh, which John was taken to this first day of the Lord's Day, they're all, every knee is going to bow to the true Messiah. You can rest assured. So we find, as in chapter 2, verse 9, and in chapter 3, verse 9, we find the drive in these two churches that Christ finds no fault with. And I'm going to tell you something. If you attend a church that does not teach the children of God who those are that claim to be of our brother Judah, but in fact are the synagogue of Satan, of the synagogue of Satan, you're in a heap of hurt. You're most likely going to be deceived. And, and you know, I imagine you would be surprised at how many people in the sound of my voice that would say, I never heard of such a thing. Well, unfortunately, it's because the book of Revelation is not taught as it should be. If you do not understand the will and the wishes of God and what makes him happy from the word, his own word, um, you know, kind of how did you ever expect to please him? Well, I didn't know. I thought we were all children of God. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Some are of the synagogue of Satan, of Satan, progeny. And, and do you know that Christ has taught this in a different place? Do you know where he taught it at? One of the greatest sermons he ever did, uh, delivered. As a matter of fact, it was his sermon concerning the sower. And he made it very clear in, in the book of Mark, if you don't understand the parable of the sower, you're not going to understand any of Christ's parables. Probably because you don't understand Revelation 2.9 and 3.9, who those are that are of the synagogue of Satan. You see, Jesus teaches in such a way that he makes it so easy for people to see truth. And that's why once they see it, you're not going to rob them of it. You're not going to change their mind once they see the truth and see how that 
some of our people are hoodwinked by so-called revolving revs or those that Jesus would warn you about in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. There will be many come in my, let no man deceive you because many will come in my name. Meaning they claim to be Christian preachers, but they're, they never quite get around to teaching what Christ taught. Let's see what Christ taught concerning those of the synagogue of Satan. He had just expo given the parable of the sower concerning the tares, which is the Kenites, the sons of Cain. And uh, do you, uh, all of you, I'm sure, know who Cain's father was. It certainly wasn't Adam. There were no traits of Adam in him. That's why that you will not find Cain in Adam's genealogy. Seth is the first listed child of Adam after Abel's death. There is a reason why. Because Cain was not the son of Adam. Jesus taught that. And um, he, he told you about these tares that look like wheat. And he said, but leave them alone. They look like children of God. But don't go pulling them out. Leave them alone. And the angels will harvest them at the end. That's why you don't mess with Kenites. You know who they are, mark them. Don't have anything to do with them. And um, the, let God take care of them. Okay, Mark 13, I want you to understand the two things that were taught about those that claim to be our brother Judah, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Which, does the synagogue of Satan exist at this time? Not yet, but it will when he's booted out to this earth. Very soon. His evil spirit is here. But Michael, in Revelation 12, 7, we'll be getting there, will literally, de facto, kick him to earth. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, pick it up with verse 35 and listen carefully. After, this follows the parable of the sower and the mustard and the leaven. Verse 35, Matthew 13, and it reads, That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. This word foundation is the katabo. Been kept secret since the overthrow of Satan. Verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Not even they got it. They couldn't see it. They didn't understand it. Verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He's explaining it now. He's not speaking in a parable, all right? Got that? Let me say it again. He is not speaking in a parable. He is being one with true words. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. That is, that is to say, the, he that was with God before the foundations of the earth, the Savior. Verse 38, the field, well, what's the field? That's where the seed was sown. The field is the world, the erets, the cosmos, this earth. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Well, what is kingdom? It's the children of the king and his dominion. That's the, who is the king? God is, our father. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Oh, my. Well, I, I wonder who the wicked one was. Now, Christ doesn't beat around the bush. You, he doesn't give you any room to play guessing games. There is only one in the same article that has to do with the katabo from verse uh, 35, the overthrow. There is one, only one evil one, and that's Satan, the devil, okay? <clears throat> well, I, I didn't know that Satan had any children here on earth. Well, then you've never studied God's word, have you? That's, that's what the word Kenite means, sons of Cain. Verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil, uh, how, well, well, wonder what he really meant by that. He meant exactly what he said. He that sowed the seed that came out to be Cain was the devil. 
the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. Uh, now, many people evidently are blind to the fact that in Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, the first prophecy in the Bible has to do with the difference between the seed of the serpent, which is the devil, and the seed of the woman. <clears throat> Just, well, I didn't know there was such a thing as the serpent seed. Then you've never read God's word. You've never studied it. And there is no way you're ever going to understand these two churches that Jesus was pleased with without it. It's essential. Why? Because it lets you know who those are that are the synagogue of Satan and do lie and, um, and quite frankly are contrary to all men. Now, he stated in this ninth verse... Uh, that um, he's going to make them come and worship at your feet on the first day of the millennium because if even a tear, a Kenite, loves the Lord and means it from the very core of his heart, loves Jesus, Yeshua, he's saved, friend. He's no longer a child of the devil. He's a child of God because God adopts him just as he does anyone. So it's well that you understand that as well. But what makes it so, and, and you know, many, like I said, many people will say, well, I didn't know Jesus taught that. Well, then you admit you're, you've never studied God's word. Once you open the door to that truth, and once you understand from John chapter, four, uh, chapter 8, verse 44, where Jesus said, you don't understand my speech because you are of your father, the devil, who was a, the first murderer in the beginning. Well, who was the first murderer? Well, Cain was, of course, because, well, where did that wickedness come from? Need I say more? You know, like I stated, once you open that door to truth, no man will ever shut it. And that person will stay with the Word of God. That's the beauty of the two churches so far out of seven that Jesus was pleased with. All the others, they're not going to make it. What is that? What really does that boil down to? What would that melt down to? You are either in a church that teaches the content that is listed in the church of Smyrna or Philadelphia, or you're out in the cold, friend. You're, you're treading water waiting to sink. The Titanic is going down. It struck the iceberg of truth, uh, and, of, and um, the iceberg of truth sinks those that play church. So uh, there you have it in verse 9 of that particular chapter, and I trust, and it's my prayer that you have eyes to see that. If it seems distant, put it on the shelf, do your best. Verse 10, returning to the third chapter of the great book of Revelation. And verse uh, 10 reads, Because, this is to the church of Philadelphia, which God loves, as well as Smyrna, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all, A-L-L, -L, all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Nobody's going anywhere. This is why God said, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls in Ezekiel chapter 13. Because they're throwing off guard and lied to about what actually um, comes down in the end generation. And if you're not familiar, if you don't have the key of David to know the truth from the fake, I, I feel sorry for you. I really do. You've listened to some man and he's misled you. And um, you need to get back into the content of Philadelphia and Smyrna, those two churches. He found no fault, but he said, I help them. I build them up. That's why you will always, when you have a church that teaches who the Kenites are, you won't see any begging because God doesn't send out beggars.
Why? Because it's a fact, it's a truth, and God supports it. God blesses it. And again, when the members' eyes are open to the truth, nobody, nobody can shut those eyes to the true word of God, whereby they are deceived. How is it that God says, I will, I will let you, allow you to, I will keep you from the hour of temptation? It's real easy. You're going to have to wait till we get to the 17th chapter to really understand the totality of the hour of temptation. It is the time that Satan is on earth, I will say that. What is temptation? I think everybody knows what temptation is. Let me ask it in a different way. Do you find Satan tempting? Do, do you find the false Messiah tempting? I would hope not. But you see, in ignorance, if you think it is the true Christ, you could be deceived real easy. But the reason you escape any temptation is we find him to be an abomination. He doesn't tempt us in any shape, form, or fashion. And we will stand against him as we did in the Kosovo, the overthrow. That is to say, um, the reason God chose the elect, and I'll say no more on that subject at this time. If you don't understand it, put it on a shelf. But you will escape the hour of temptation because you do not find him tempting. And he cannot harm a hair of your head. We are given, even today, all power over spiritual entities that come against truth. And we're not afraid to use the two-edged sword, which is the word that comes from the mouth of Christ, which is to say, truth. Uh, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Um, again, I think it's impossible for one of God's elect to lose a crown because I don't think you could get to anyone to shut the door. Verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. You know, in um, Isaiah chapter 62, verse 14, Isaiah 62, verse 14, God states there what he calls his uh, children. He says, I'm going to give you a new name. It's Hepzibah. Hepzibah means my delight is in her. And I'm going to call your land Beulah. Do you know what the word Beulah means? It means married. Your land is married. God loves that place called Jerusalem, Mount Zion. In Ezekiel chapter 16, he made an eternal covenant with it as his most favorite place in the universe. He loves it. That's the place he has chosen. And hey, if he chose it, guess what? It's all his. He's got it. So um, there you are. I, I, you can hardly help but to be awed with God's promise that if you stand against the false Messiah, if you overcome, that he makes you a pillar in the temple of God. Do you know what a pillar is? That holds it up. And what is even more awesome is when you take it to the full uh, truth and understand is when we get to the 21st chapter, we're going to learn that the eternal temple doesn't exist. It has no temple for the Father and the Son or the temple thereof. And then when you relate that back to Ezekiel 44, 
And God said concerning his elect, don't give them any allotment of land. No inheritance for mine elect because I am their inheritance. And when you, when you add that back to Revelation 21, that the temple itself is the Father and the Son, and that you are a pillar therein, that's awesome. That is, I mean, that will touch your heart and your mind. How can you help but love your Father when you realize that if you overcometh, if you see the truth, if you have eyes to see, and if you stood against them or chosen even before the foundations of the earth, as it is written, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, how exciting that is. Any part of that you don't understand, just set it on the shelf there and let it rest, okay? Uh, verse 13. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So there you have two out of six. You know, that's not very good odds. Now we're going to take in the seventh, and you're going to find out there was only two out of seven that Christ was happy with, and that you would, if you went with the doctrine, you would overcome. You see, any of the other, if you might overcome if you avoided the doctrine of those churches. But the only way you would overcome is if you did avoid it and individually stayed righteous and didn't partake of their traditions that make void the Word of God. Verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the that's it the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Who was there at the beginning of the creation of God? Christ was, of course, the Savior. 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither, neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. I'd rather you were one way or the other. I'd rather you did something and stand in the middle, never making a decision. Stand for something. Verse 16, so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Whoa, don't go to that church, friend. Well, they're just good old boys, you know. Uh, they're, we don't want to offend anyone. We want to do what's politically uh, correct. Uh, that way, if we never say anything, we certainly can't offend anyone, can we, brother? Dear brother, beware that uh, malarkey. Okay? A man that won't take a stand for truth because it might offend somebody is worthless. As far as serving God, absolutely worthless. You either are for something, basically, or you're against it. You're in activity. You're in action. You're pulling lost little old sheep that are wimps away from truth that causes them to stand. God doesn't like it. Of all the churches, he speaks the hardest to this one that is a do-nothing. Nice little church next door. Get along with the whole community. Anybody could come to this church. It doesn't matter. Just hang your hat and sing the praises. And we'll have one verse that, and never pick a verse that might be offensive to the least little soul. If a soul is sinning, straighten them out. If somebody is doing something wrong, the scripture that corrects them is the real show of love, not nothingness. Lukewarm. God hates it. All right, bless your heart. Don't attend that church, okay? The, these church names mean nothing. It's the content. We'll pick this church back up again in the next lecture. Least thought of by God of all the seven. 
Well, if it was just lukewarm, it wasn't cold and it wasn't hot, they really didn't do anything. That's what's wrong with it. That's what makes it a sin deluxe. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. Listen a moment, won't you please?